on behalf of the Human Rights Program, the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture, and the Center for International Studies, I want to welcome you to this Martin Luther King Day event, reflecting on the anti-apartheid movement, South African and U.S. perspectives. I also, of course, want to welcome our distinguished speakers. Given the occasion, it seems appropriate to note that the struggles against apartheid in South Africa and racism in the United States and elsewhere were more international and over a longer period of time than our national narratives usually reveal. In 1962, ANC President Alfred Lutuli, recipient of the 1960 Nobel Peace Prize, and Martin Luther King Jr., who had received the same prize in 1964, jointly issued an appeal for action against apartheid directed at, quote, all men of goodwill, unquote. Remember, this was before the 1964 Civil Rights Act was almost derailed by the inclusion of women. Um, but this was for circulation, especially to an American audience. I'm going to read just a little piece of it. The American <coughs> public is a reality today only because the peoples and governments of the world have been unwilling to place her in quarantine. Translate public opinion into public action. We therefore ask all men of goodwill to take action against apartheid in the following manner. Hold meetings and demonstrations on December 10th, Human Rights Day. Urge your church, union, lodge, or club to observe this day as one of protest. Urge your government to support economic sanctions. Write to your mission to the United Nations, urging adoption of a resolution calling for international isolation of South Africa. Don't buy South Africa's products. Don't trade or invest in South Africa. Translate public, opi public opinion into public action by explaining facts to all peoples groups to which you belong, and to countries of which you are citizens until an effective international quarantine of apartheid is established. Just to remind the, the contemporaneity of the anti-apartheid struggle and the civil rights struggle in this country were more closely connected. At a more personal level, but still on the topic of the international nature of the struggle, I met Justice Sachs the South African in New York in 1989, and Prexy Nesbitt, the Chicagoan in South Africa in 1993. Each of these men has spent decades fighting against apartheid and racism and for justice and equality. Albie Sachs participated in the defiance campaigns of the 1950s and as a lawyer defended South Africans against increasingly repressive apartheid laws. For this, he was detained multiple times in the 1960s, finally going into exile, first in Britain and then in Maputo, where he taught law at the University of Maputo, and where in 1988 he was injured by a bomb planted in his car by the South African security forces. In 1990, he returned to South Africa and served on the ANC's National Executive and Constitutional Committee. In 1996, Nelson Mandela named him to the Constitutional Court. Many of you who may have heard his previous talks in Chicago will be familiar with some of his important jurisprudence on the court. On the obligations of, gov of government and the progressive realization of social and economic rights, including particularly rights to health and housing, and on the constitutionality of same-sex marriage. Praxi Nesbitt grew up in an activist family on the west side of Chicago. Though I know his activism dates even earlier, I know that by the time he was enrolled in Antioch College in the mid-1960s, he was leading local campaigns to desegregate Southern Ohio institutions and for Antioch College to disinvest from South Africa-related firms. He went on to study in Tanzania, to lead the campaign to oppose bank loans in South Africa, to work for the World Council of Churches program to combat racism in Geneva, and to serve as a union organizer, an educator, and a tireless activist in Chicago. Please join me in welcoming Praxi Nesbitt and Abby Sachs. Well, uh, I was thinking a lot about uh, sort of how to kick this off a little bit, and I decided that one of the things that would do it would be to say a little a word or two about Dennis Brutus. As many of you may know in this room, Dennis Brutus passed uh, this last two weeks or so uh, in South Africa. He taught uh, here at Northwestern for many years. He also taught at the University of Pittsburgh, also in the States. But he was most well known internationally for his extraordinary work against uh, uh, 
steering up the sports boycott uh, and using sport as a vehicle to isolate the apartheid regime and, 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 and other issues. Dennis went on from that to work on many, many other issues as, as well as being a superb poet. Well, Dennis was the person that I was very fortunate to know when I was at Antioch College when I started a, a group working on uh, uh, the apartheid issue in 65. And then in 1970, I started working for the American Committee on Africa. And Dennis, I invited him to come here and speak once. And about f 10 blocks north here on Drexel, there used to be a place called the Afro Arts Theater. And as one of my first organizing ventures in this city, in either 70 or 71, uh, I brought Dennis to come and speak at the Afro Arts Theater. Uh, apartheid was not a known issue here in the States in those days. Uh, and it was an issue that only a few people worked on very hard. Uh, like that distinguished man that just came in the door Otis Cunningham and I worked on a little publication called uh, the Afro-American <laughs> Journal, or I can't even remember the African the Agenda. African agenda. <laughs> uh, but in 1970 or 71, uh, there was not a lot of organizing on the apartheid issue. And so I had organized. Uh, I don't know if Otis remembers this, but we had this event I'll be at the old Afro Arts Theater. And that day was a wonderful day for an event. And we'd done all our homework, and we got a great turnout. And as the event started, just as we began, about 250 young men, all dressed the same way, filed in and took over the entire theater. It was the Blackstone Rangers, and I had done everything but sort of clear it with the Blackstone Rangers that we could do this event in their turf at the Afro Arts Theater. So they filed in and silently just stood around the edge, and then several came up and sort of formed a phalanx across the front of the stage. Dennis and I were standing there, and Dennis said to me, whispered, Prexy, what are we going to do? I said, hell if I know, Dennis. Then he said, well, we got to do something. I said, well, I'll tell you, Dennis, you're going to give the best speech you have ever given in your life <laughs> right now. So I went on to introduce Dennis Brutus, and Dennis did exactly that. He gave a talk that took the realities of apartheid and talked about it in a way that made sense to all that group of young men uh, who had come there with a lot of anger in their hearts and on their minds to basically turn it out, but in fact stayed for the whole event. Dennis wrote a poem, and a wonderful book, Letters to Martha, a wonderful collection. And I think he, he says something here that I just want to share with you. It's a very short little dedication for Prexy and appreciation and admiration. Without information and organization, we cannot win. The role of the American Committee on Africa in informing people in the U.S. of the struggle in South Africa has been of enormous importance. Our sincere thanks. Amandla, ever, Dennis Brutus, Chicago, March 1970. It's a pretty amazing statement, and I think it foresaw what was going to be coming down the road, Albie, in terms of uh, the organizing we'd done. Now, one of the people that most, I, I, you have no idea how honored I am here today. Um, if there's any one person that has probably influenced me more than anybody else in getting involved in all this work, it would be Albie. And I think Albie may not remember this, but I first met Albie in London in 1968 and pretty much hung at your house. Uh, and had you and Stephanie uh, teaching me. And I, then I think hosted you several times, Otis and I, African American Solidarity Committee here in Chicago. But it was that 68 period when I knew so little about this and was in London and really learned about it from you and Stephanie 
It was such a, it, it, it's that that makes me feel very honored to be here with you. That's my initial comment, mm. Albie. No, thanks, Pixie. This guy was burning, 68. Uh, it, it was a powerful year. Incredible period. Uh, 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 the image that springs to mind was, uh, was it Carlos Lewis and... In, in Mexico. And in Mexico, the Olympic Games, I think it was 68. That's right. And giving the clinch fist the black power salute. And wow, it just went around the world. Uh, they weren't very popular with the Sporting Federation here in the United States, but boy, they were popular throughout the world. Absolutely. And there was an element of defiance. And this guy comes from Chicago, and he wants to move the revolution forward in South Africa. And he was incandescent. It was a fantastic interaction. And we're ANC, and we're slowing things down a little bit, and strategic and long term and bringing people in and building up alliances and winning over friends and isolating the extreme and so on and so forth. So that passion, that bite, that energy, which was terrific coming from uh, North America together with the, it's really decades of experience, uh, made, made for a marvelous sort of a combustion. And then, um, I mean, we can spend the whole two hours just praising each other. So I'll just... <laughs> <laughs> I'll just do that for a few minutes. But uh, Prexy, uh, Hayward Burns is possibly my most significant um, person introducing me to the United States of America. And Hayward just knew everybody. Absolutely. All the communities and all the sections. And he was fantastic, based in, in New York. And Prexy was my Midwest, um, uh, the, the sort of the porter, the person who opened doors and uh, gave me a, a sense of Chicago. Again, I don't know why certain memories come to mind. Uh, you took me to Gary, Indiana. I'll never forget that trip. Now, I've uh, <laughs> never found out to this day why it's called Gary, Indiana. It's and, a song. Uh, I've Gary, actually, Indiana, Gary, yeah. Indiana. Now, now, there's a song yeah. based on that. But you, you, you don't speak about Chicago, Illinois. But it's always Gary, Indiana. In the event, so that was just a little curiosity, and everybody told me about the song, but nobody could explain why it, 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 it's connected up. But you took me to, I mean, then you just saw the smoke hanging over the other side of the lake, and, and it was very, very heavy. And you took me to one of the, 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 the factory wasn't functioning, must have been a weekend, and you pointed to the, the car lot, and you said, you know, just how disgusting this was, that the workers just get a miserable big open lot to park their cars. And I thought, gee, you know, our workers don't have motor cars. They don't have bicycles. They walk. They take trains. But it was just an example of, you know, the uneven way different societies function and the different ways in which marginalization uh, reflects, marginalization is reflected. It just came through very, very strongly. Then uh, I stayed with you in the south side. We went to the station and, and I said, you know, Prexy, we could be in Soweto, except in Soweto you'd see at least a few faces that weren't black. You know, Soweto was a little more integrated than, <laughs> <laughs> than, than this, this railway station. That hasn't changed a whole lot, else. Yeah. <laughs> so, so these were personal encounters and, and, and discoveries um, which can be multiplied many times. And I think one of the great things about the anti-apartheid movement throughout the world was it brought people together who otherwise might not have met. Uh, I meet many people in this country and in the United Kingdom and Sweden elsewhere who say they were politicized. Their first political action was, had to do with, with apartheid. And in a way, it, it's shameful. Our country was so awful that it spurred on people everywhere in the world to move. But also, we had such a good struggle, such a powerful movement, uh, and people were so stirred that uh, those who mightn't have become active uh, became active, and then it spread out to other issues. Once you get that thing about injustice, then it doesn't stop with one particular campaign. 
I'm going to mention just three items and then mm. I'll bounce the ball back to, to, to Prexy. The first, I went to Harvard, it would have been early 80s, and uh, I went to the receptionist in the law faculty, and I said, can I speak to Albert Sachs, the dean of Harvard <laughs> law faculty was Albert Sachs. <laughs> and she said, yes, who should I say is calling? <laughs> I said, Albert Sachs. <laughs> And she thought I was a little bit wacky. I didn't have to show her an ID, but eventually she could see I was actually a rather serious person. <laughs> and, and we had a good meeting, and I wish I remembered the exact date. It might have been a little later. Uh, and I think I met the, who's the big shot head honcho in Harvard? What's it? I, I think it was, might have been, I forget who it was, but what, what's the title? The provost, not the provost, the principal, the... President, the, president of Harvard. The president, the president, yeah. Derek Bach. It was Bach. I think it was Bach. It was Bach. And I was called in, and there were just about three of us, uh, and he said, uh, Professor Sachs, or Advocate Sachs, Mr. Sachs, uh, you know, the question of divestment has cropped up and, and we're discussing it. Um, he said, of course, it's a very difficult issue, isn't it? I said, Mr. President, there's not a less difficult issue in the whole world. <laughs> uh, apartheid is just blatantly unfair, unjust, it's in the laws. It's literally black and white. There's no easier question in the world. More difficult is how to respond to it, but the need to respond uh, is as self-evident as any need could be anywhere. And maybe he wanted to be bland. I'm not sure what his own position was. Uh, I got the feeling, I think there were three of them and they were divided. Uh, and then it seemed a pretty remote thing was a kind of a, something that was simmering and quite interesting and intellectually, morally interesting, but pretty remote. Not many years later, wow, wow. And they weren't sitting around debating and discussing in broad terms. Uh, students were sitting in, they were protesting, people were going for their parents, uh, it was a whole swathe, new swathe of, of people from all sorts of backgrounds, just standing up on a very powerful moral position. Uh, our university, in particular the universities, has got a huge amount of shareholding in companies that are benefiting from the exploitation in South Africa, and they're propping up apartheid there. It was wonderful to see. Uh, I, when I traveled around, never called upon people to divest. Uh, I left it to Brexit to do that. <laughs> I didn't feel it was for me to come to the US and tell people how to conduct themselves and how to struggle. But I don't think anybody had any doubts where I stood. And if people asked me questions, I could respond to the questions. But I kept insisting, this is an American issue. We are fighting for our freedom in our country, but you must decide yourselves how you feel as a nation, as students at universities, as shareholders in big companies and so on, you must decide how you feel about the fact that you're getting these very special profits because people are being shot down, trade unions are being suppressed, they aren't ordinary workers' rights. People can't protest through the vote. They don't have freedom of speech. Our leaders are all in prison. You must decide. And I think, I think it's actually a sensible way to approach on, on any issue. People don't like to be told what to do and, and be pushed and bullied and harassed into taking moral positions. They like to get the information and feel we are deciding we're going to do it. Well, that, that, that's the one story. 
The other story is a story totally against myself. It was round about 83, 84, and um, I think it was Johnny Macatini mm. who told me I met in, in New York. He was the ANC representative at the United Nations. And he said, I'll be a whole new strategy is being developed, an anti apartheid strategy. And it's being based on the black community. I was skeptical uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, partly the community was battling so much itself. I mean, I'd lived through the period, I remember coming here, the Black Panthers, the others being shot down, marginalized, disinformation. Um, Martin Luther King hadn't been canonized. Now, you know, it, it, I think it's wonderful and amazing that he is honored in the way that he is, but it, it, it's waiting till a nice safe distance in time uh, ha has arrived so that he can't cause any more trouble. <laughs> um, many of us were torn between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, representing the two trends and supporting the strengths that each one had, had to contribute. And I just couldn't see the black community having the, the power, the forcefulness, and the cohesion to promote a powerful anti-apartheid movement. I was wrong. I was wrong, 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 wrong. And sometimes it's wonderful to be wrong. It's wonderful to be wrong. The Free South Africa movement transformed the whole issue. I don't know exactly why. I've, I've never really quite understood American politics. Mm. It has its own dynamics, its own mechanics, all sorts of different themes and people and so on are playing different roles. Um, but this somehow transformed what was a very powerful, mainly youth, anti-apartheid struggle centered on universities, to some extent churches, people in companies, shareholders and so on, into a national issue. And with the protests outside the South African Embassy in Washington and people training, going to jail, uh, suddenly it took on a whole new dynamic. And it looked so bleak in the early 80s. Far away issue, politically divided society, everybody in their own little ghettos and silos, the women's movement here doing terrific work, but disconnected from the labor unions, disconnected from the faith organizations, disconnected from the black community. Uh, then I would meet some people uh, from the African-American community and say, wow, that's a Vimby. He's great, just look at that beard he's got. You know, the, 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 the shallowness, of just a kind of a photogenic image. Well, I was wrong. I was wrong. Something ignited then, and that became the core. Uh, and suddenly, within a couple of years, the anti-apartheid legislation passed in, uh, in Congress. And even Ronald Reagan, unable to prevent it. This was sensational for us, sensational. And the significance of that is that South Africa's, white South Africa's last major ally, the one who stood as a kind of bulwark, uh, a guarantor, a protector, talking about constructive engagement and bringing about change peacefully and nicely and all the rest. Suddenly, that last standby for white South Africa was not standing by anymore. And then when the banks refused to roll over loans, that was the, that was the final thing. Pick Water, the foreign minister, said, the hole in the boat was too big. We were shipping out water. Now, obviously, this, this whole movement uh, was responding to struggle inside South Africa. Uh, if we'd had a compliant and compliant population. If there hadn't been scenes of protest and demonstrations, if there hadn't been a huge international campaign 
and the sports boycotts, and um, eventually emerging with the Free Mandela campaign and 70,000 young people uh, in, in Wembley on, on Mandela's birthday, uh, suddenly it just became like a huge movement. Uh, and, and, but the culmination, I would say, that last bit where they just couldn't bail out the water anymore was when their most trusted, reliable ally of white domination in southern Africa playing on the Cold War uh, was no longer able, able to help. The very last story was um, last year. Uh, I, I become quite friendly with Ruth Bader Ginsburg of the Supreme Court, and she's visited uh, South Africa. She was our host. Uh, she spent uh, a few days at the Constitutional Court. She actually made her... her um, pronouncement gave a talk on why American judges can benefit from drawing anything that's advantageous from judgments in other countries, from opinions in other countries. She made it in the foyer of the Constitutional Court. Hmm. She chose that place uh, to, to do it. And she said it's the most beautiful court she's ever seen. So we brought out a book and I think I saw a copy here. Yeah, it just so happens. <laughs> this is outside the front door, and then that, that's the foyer inside. Um, and I asked her to speak at the launch of this book. Uh, and somehow we ended up in the Cosmos Club. Now, any of you from Washington? I'm sure you all hang out at the Cosmos Club. <laughs> uh, I hadn't even heard of it. And they've got a wall full of Nobel Prize winners and Pulitzer Prize winners. I'm sure you hop in there every time you... <laughs> every time I go to D.C. In the neighborhood. Is it near the Supreme Court? It's not too far from I the Supreme I've Court. I think I've seen the place. And it's very... <laughs> you've driven I've past seen the place, place. yeah. I've driven by Anyway, it. There, there I am. Uh, and we'd been invited by a guy. I only wish I, I knew his name. He told me four times in about three minutes that he'd been locked up for protesting outside the American, South African embassy <laughs> in Washington. And his wife, who was sitting at the other end of the table, told me five times. Uh, and, and he is the head of a huge petroleum company. But this was like a, a super special moment in their lives. Something where they went outside of themselves they did something they'd never done before, they'd never do again. Uh, and he just felt such a marvelous connection with South Africa, the change, the democratic transformation, Mandela, everything that it stood for. But he couldn't help telling me how often, <laughs> he, 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 uh, he couldn't tell me often enough how he'd been locked up on that occasion. Uh, and for me, it's very, very heartwarming to meet people in different countries We've got similar stories, running onto a football field, people who are very well behaved and very, very polite to interfere with a rugby game, uh, just people doing something kind of really, really special. And it was all because of their support for the anti-apartheid struggle. Maybe in question time, I, I'd like, I can be, say a little bit about how the American struggle fed back into our imaginations. But I think that, that those are the points I wanted to make. Well, I think there's point. a... There's a couple of things that I want to, one thing I want to, 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 to have a friendly further discussion about, but there's a couple of points that I want to make very quickly. One of them is that we are in a period where, frighteningly, I think the history has been revised sufficiently now that it's, just as in South Africa, I've noted that you have a lot of people who are all saying, I knew nothing about apartheid whatsoever. I had nothing to do with it. We have a whole lot of people now in this country who all claim that they were leading activists <laughs> in the anti-apartheid struggle. Uh, so I, I could just see this corporate executive, and not necessarily the particular person you're talking about, but we listened to a story the other day here, 
I'm trying to think of the name of this commentator who is very light on NPR, black commentator, uh, has his own show. I'm trying to think of Tra Travis Smiley had a show recently where he said in the show, he said, we have to thank Leon Sullivan for the great contributions he made to the anti-apartheid movement. I was furious. I, mean, I, I just couldn't believe it. I could barely drive my car because if anybody was one of the main people who tried to stem the tide of the growing struggle and, and organizing against apartheid and the work of the divestment movement, it was this minister from Philadelphia who was a member of the General Motors board who designed these six principles called the Sullivan Principles to allow the corporations to remain in South Africa and stay there and continue to make business and make profit. And we organized a major summit of black ministers from throughout the country to denounce his principles and denounce him. Well, he then went on and he got kind of ballyhooed into being in what I call an ebony star. You know, I have, I distinguish between Africans and African Americans who are ebony African Americans or Africans and those who are just regular folk like me. You see, if you're an ebony African American, your, your beard is just, it's perfect. There is no hair out of place whatsoever. So this Leon Sullivan is in that group but actually have played a much more sinister role in that. Well, I think the other thing that I would like to comment on, though, has to do with a very serious discussion. And before I come to that, though, I, I do want us to give a context, because I think it's very important for Albie's first trip here in, and I think it was about 1970, was it for this trial of Dennis? 75, was, could it have been that? My first trip was 74. 74, and we went down to Gary, as Albie said, but Albie made a very important comment. We were standing in Miller, Indiana. Some of you here may know Miller. And we were looking back up, at, and you could see silhouetted U.S. Steel and Inland, and, and, and Albie said these are the companies that help to sustain the misery and the suffering that my people are going through. And my own recollection was in taking Albie to Gary at that time, which now Albie is as much a ghost town as you can find anywhere in the world, in taking you there was that my hope was to see the, the connection. And I think that that governed, that, that impulse governed, motivated so much of our organizing, was an effort constantly to try to forge the connections, to make people feel that there was a direct connect. Now, I, I argue in a book that some of you may know in Albie, I don't know if you've ever gotten a copy of it, something that you should certainly have called uh, No Easy Victories. It's been edited by a man named Bill Mentor. If you all have never seen it, you should. One of the contributors to it is back there in the back, Lisa Brock. And the book is the history of the US anti-apartheid movement. And at one point in that book, I argue that I think that the anti-apartheid movement was one of the finest moments of multiracial social change organizing that has ever happened in this country. I go on to say it was not easy. It was never without real tensions, difficulties, challenges, internal fights that were just up the gabuzo. We had a fight right here at the University of Chicago, Albion, I'll never forget it. And many people in this room will forget that we almost came to knock down, drag out blows over whether we supported the ANC or supported the PAC. And there are people in this room who could talk about how, how, how dire a question that was because it reflected what, what you envisioned as the enemy. And if you were with the ANC, you envisioned a world that was white, black, brown, red, but if you were with the PAC in this city particularly, you were basically talking the PAC's line of drive the whites out to the sea. 
And so that fight was an intense, intense discussion right here in Idenois, if I'm not mistaken, with people here who now, many of them are all like saying that they supported the ANC. They only say that now because of Mandela's fame. They really were big PAC supporters throughout that period of time. Well, from that, I have gone on to another major discussion that I, I think is a very important discussion. And that is the question of analyzing what Albie mentioned already, analyzing this question of the mobilization that took place in this country. And what was it that really made it possible for there to be such a, an incredible accomplishment as the passage of the 1986 Comprehensive Sanctions Against South Africa that Albie is talking about? And it was an incredible achievement. And it was made even more incredible by the fact, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, Evelyn, when Reagan sanctioned it, I mean, uh, vetoed it, then we had to come back and mobilize that many more people. It never would have got, gotten to that point. There's no doubt about it. Had it not been for the takeover that took place uh, of tran by Trans-Africa and the Free South Africa movement that Albie is talking about, mm -hmm. of the South African embassy. It was a brilliant moment uh, conceived by a brilliant strat strategist, uh, Randall Robinson, who incidentally I think has never been given really his due for the work that he did. But on the other hand, I think that it's really not the total reading of the thing to just see that as being couched in the African-American community. I, 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 the roots of the African-American experience with and, and, and concern about South Africa go so deep, far beyond King. They go all so far back. I mean, the 1948 mobilization at Madison Square Garden when the 1946 mine workers strike, 46, not 48, in that mine workers strike, that uh, the, the famous one in South Africa, the, the, the Council of African Affairs, Lisa could say more about this than I can, mobilized a, de a demonstration in Madison Square Garden, 10,000 people in solidarity with this mine workers strike in South Africa. That was the work of Du Bois and Robeson and Hinton and these people who came out of the council in 1946, the church involvement, black churches involvement, all of those, that connection goes very, very deep. But my point is another one. And that point is that from the 19, late 70s, I dated from the death of Biko onwards, America, on a much broader level, begins to follow what's happening in South Africa. It, it was a moment of media coverage that I've never seen since, ever. The, the extent to which the South African struggle got just picked up by the media day in and day out, again and again. That whole period of, of Nightline and what was that guy's name? I can't, Ted Koppel and interviewing Winnie, interviewing this one, covering, holding hands with Winnie. Every night was Ted in South Africa. It was just an incredible engagement level that I've never seen since. I think that led to many ordinary Americans being then involved with South Africa, maybe in a level that we've never uh, ever reached on any other foreign policy issue. Into that situation steps Randall Robinson and the Trans-Africa Group, brilliant group of strategists, who then bring forward a tactic that electrified this nation, and that was the celebrities being arrested night after night, hundreds and hundreds of people, swells to finally something like 60,000 people arrested all over this country, protesting against South Africa, that then did give a kind of drama and publicity to South Africa that we have never, I think, ever achieved with another foreign policy issue. And I, 
I, I, I, I want to say that I think it's certainly true that the African American people have carried the brunt of the concern around the question of South Africa and maybe African questions generally. And maybe that's one of the difficulties with the, the Sudan question today, frankly, is that we haven't picked that up in the same way. But I also think it's very important that so many young whites and Latinos and others in this country cut their eye teeth on organizing on any social issue around the work they did on campuses and churches and in unions around the issue of South Africa so that there's any number of people doing all kinds of environmental work, union organizing, peace work, all kind of work who, who started out as activists in the anti-apartheid movement. And, and, and I want to emphasize, it was not easy, as, as Evelyn has written in her, her writing on this. The struggles that went on were, became a kind of laboratory about our own relations, Albie, mm. in this country. The struggles on campuses and in organizations. Here in Chicago, let's be very frank, we had two groups. We had a black group on the South Side doing anti-apartheid work, and we had a a uh, predominantly white group on the North side doing anti-apartheid work, and I used to go crazy trying to go backward and forward between the two of them because you all at the ANC had told me in Lusaka and Dar es Salaam that I had to work with everybody. <laughs> so uh, here I am going backward and forward trying to talk to everybody. But it reflected, I think, the ongoing challenge that we have in this country to really be successful, in my view, we have to overcome the kinds of antagonisms and tensions that we have out of the kind of what I call apartheid Chicago kind of circumstance that we have here. That's a few small little thoughts for us. Can I ask you to address one thing and then maybe when you have we can open the floor for sure. questions. It, one thing that concerns me is that uh, for Americans, the struggle against apartheid ended with the elections in 1994. Um, and I mean, Praxis already commented that uh, never before or since the mid-1980s has there been so much attention. Um, South Africa's tro troubles didn't end. Racial inequality didn't end in 1994. Um, and I'm wondering if you could each make a few comments um, about the difficulties um, when your target becomes sort of more complex and, or your, what you're fighting for and against is no longer as clear as it was. I remember I did a lot of anti-apartheid work in, in, in the States, uh, traveling from city to city uh, very rarely sent to the South, actually. I had to bully my host to say, please let me go. I went to National once and, and to Louisiana. So there's a kind of a circuit. And I made friends everywhere. And I could see the audiences getting bigger and more intense. And now they're reporting back to me. And um, it, it was very encouraging. And whenever I denounced apartheid, there was total conviction. But when I said we're going to have a non-racial democracy, I just saw the eyes glaze over. Come off it. Get real. You know, after centuries of oppression, all the division, the hatreds, uh, we can't get together in this country with a constitution that's been going for so long and people who have access to the vote and so on, forget about it. And I think the 1994 elections did more than simply signal the end of apartheid. Uh, to me, it was a huge validation of idealism, of moral principle. It was a massive justification of the principle stand that people had taken here. I certainly see that in my life. Uh, and I found that generally. Uh, it gets projected onto the person of Nelson Mandela. And if ever there was a person with the capacity to soak up a kind of praise and adulation like that, it is Nelson Mandela. 
But I mean, he didn't make the struggle. He just found a beautiful voice for it and a personality representing it. So I think that's something that, that, that's enduring and, um, and very valuable. And we now travel, I mean, I've been to Sri Lanka in, as it turned out, completely vain attempts to support movements for peace between the Tamil Tigers. I've spoken to them and, you know, and the government, uh, to Israel-Palestine on one occasion, uh, Northern Ireland, where the South African story was immensely important. Uh, now, we would have been the last. I think we were given the least hope of any of the countries that I've mentioned. And yet, now it's almost taken for granted. So to me, that's a permanent, enduring, lasting achievement. Uh, and it shows the importance of good political leadership, mature political leadership that doesn't diminish passion, commitment, dedication, but is strategic, is thinking, is thoughtful, is, it, it spreads its wings, it embraces, embraces others. Now, I feel all of that has been basically maintained. Now, having become a democratic country, we have all the problems, the messes, the setbacks, the disappointments, the joys, the breakthroughs that a democratic country has. We've got to live with it. So we're not living in an elated state. And there never was euphoria in South Africa. At the time of the so-called euphoria in 94, uh, there was a low-grade civil war going on in KwaZulu-Natal. People were being pushed off trains in Johannesburg. There were secret assassination squads. There were self-defense units fighting each other. We had completely divided administration, civil service, separate armies. Heaven knows we've got enough problems with our military in South Africa now, over labor conditions and so on. But these were armies, an army made up of competence on other sides, fighting each other. I mean, when peace came in Vietnam, the American army and the Vietnamese army didn't integrate. They just <laughs> kept to their separate countries. We've integrated those armies that were at each other's throats. So I think the, the accomplishments have been enormous. And in that sense, there is a constitutional foundation and a kind of a steadiness. The inequalities are still evident, massive. The poverty, uh, maybe 40% of the people are poor. And of that, 20% are desperately poor. And there is a, a fair amount of welfare and children are getting grants and old age people are getting grants and the social benefits. So there there's, isn't much starvation, but there's hunger. Lots of hunger that's barely counted. Uh, and the divisions still track race. You go to big shopping malls now, you see the nation there. Black, white, brown, uh, it's not just whites who are spending or buying, who are living in decent homes, buying uh, motor cars, clothing, food. Uh, I've seen Treasure, is it Treasure Island here? Yes. Uh, I, I suspect it's a bit unusual in, in Chicago. But you've got hundreds of Treasure Islands in terms of the clientele the, all over South Africa. Uh, but there's still this massive poverty and people are trapped and it, the school system doesn't cater and the health system doesn't cater. And, uh, and, and a lot we've inherited. We pick up the problems of world recession and so on, but we make our own mistakes. And sometimes they're avoidable and just unacceptable and we get angry and cross about it. But it's a very free and open society. People speak their minds. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of dynamic. So... Um, for me personally, I'd say there are two things that, that I actually welcome. Uh, I don't look back on the good old days of the struggle with a sense of, of nostalgia. We had fantastic camaraderie and we made bonds, we broke through barriers. Uh, we were exalted quite often, but we lived in dread. We saw people being killed, 
we lost so much, we became tunnel visioned, narrow, because you just had to focus on something. Um, it was a bizarre existence. Human beings shouldn't have to live like that. I don't, in that sense, um, I don't look back just with, I can't read my own book set in that time because it pulls me back into that world of constant anxiety, tension, dread. Will I get through the day? Will I survive? And millions of people living like that. The other aspect, I, I once shocked an audience by saying that the paradox of, of, of our lives was that we were fighting with all our passion to create a boring society. <laughs> where you don't put yourself on the line with everything you're doing all the time. But there were other sides to us. Some, so, some of our people are against. They contrary. They challenge, they denounce, and they're good at it, and we need them. Even after democracy, we need them. The critics, terrific. But some of us want to heal. We want to grow, we want to nurture. And we've only had a chance with the changes now to develop our whole side of our nature, of our nature, of our capacities. Maybe little dreams you had before you got involved in politics that you would be a sort of a healer, somehow or another, or an adventurer, or fly to the moon, or find a microbe smaller than anybody ever found. You had to abandon all those things. And now we've had a chance and whether it's writing, or painting, or building, or designing, or writing judgments for a court, I have just loved doing that. Uh, I've loved the opportunity to express a side of myself that is just somehow suppressed, and come out in little ways, you know, all the time, but now it, it, it can really, really, really flower. So not to be dominated by all the ins and outs and the ups and downs and this person and that person and Tabo and Zuma, all the rest. Of course, that's, that's the fun and the disappointment and the bravura and the pettiness and the banality of, of political life. But for me, those deep themes that um, emerged in the course of, of a lifelong struggle for our generation, other generations, uh, to me, they still remain. Well, I think we, we're just dominated by banalities in this country. I think that that's one of the most fundamental difficulties that we have. And that I think part of what excites people who go to South Africa, and, I, I, and I'll, be, I'll have to say Southern Africa, because for me, it's not just taking people, I do a lot of taking people to not just South Africa, but to Mozambique, to Angola, to Namibia, to the whole region. I think that part of what's exciting to people who go and then never stop going is because people sing. Mm. They, people sing still in Southern Africa. We've stopped, you know, e even in, in Southern parts of the United States, and I, I'm sorry you never saw the South, because the South is really very much more like Southern Africa. The, the, the singing is still there. The, it's not just dominated with with getting things and with uh, this fear of everybody and with the, 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 the accumulation thing that we're so into here in this country. And sometimes young people that I work with just scare me to death right now because there is so little, and they, frankly though, I'm scared about that in South Africa too, Albie. I am scared of this next generation that knows so little and seems not to give two hoops in hell in the fact that they don't know nothing. Now, of course, University of Chicago students undoubtedly are different. <laughs> but, and I want to be sure to get my honorarium, so I've got to say that. But, 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 but the general thing of just having your ears and your, uh, some more, what do you call that thing? The, 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 huh? the iPod, to have it in your ears and the iPod and, and just tuning out the rest. And what I think is, 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 the, is the richest thing that we have to offer is the history that we've had in this country. We don't, by the way, I'll be going back to something else. We don't celebrate King. We, we don't celebrate. It, it is the ultimate corporatization 
that takes place in general about King. When you have some of the same companies that stand for everything King, everything the King was against, who now come forward on this day to, to talk about their embrace of Dr. King, it's just, it's, 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 I think, the banalities. Uh, is that going to change, though? I think it's going to change. I think it's going to change. Because I think that we're at such a crisis in this country right now that I think we're in a new period. It is definitely much more complex. I, I'm very struck with, and, I, and one of the things I'm very fearful about is there was this incredible moment of young folks galvanizing around the Obama moment. Now we're seeing all these disappointments that Obama is up against. And I'm, I'm very sad about that because I think that if, if one thing, if no other thing we, we've learned out of all the Southern Africa work is that it's a long-term process and Obama shouldn't be abandoned now and what he stood for. I mean, yeah, they're all kind of, you all, I could write a book about the contra contradictions around Obama, but I'm going to stand by him right now. Just like when Harold was first elected in the city, I stood by Harold. Harold said to me one day when I was working for him, he said, Harold Washington, this is, he said, I, I don't control my police department, Prexy. You know that. I can't do any, I can't make serious overnight changes with the police department. This was just after Flint, just after a, one of those Latino ministers had been brutalized by the police shortly after Harold's election. And the Latino community was furious and they came down to meet with Harold about it. And I think that Obama's in a similar situation in many respects, with not even the, the, the depth of, and, the, and years of experience that Harold brought into his, 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 uh, his day in, in, the, in that period. But I think that we, we've got to have the patience of long-term struggle. See long-term solutions and see short solutions. I, frankly, Albie, I think going back also, I think that one of the other reasons people aren't as engaged on Southern Africa these days is stuff that they hear that comes out of Southern Africa that's very, very frightening to people. The homophobia that's been expressed by some of the Southern African leaders is very upsetting to many, many people in this country and is not, it, it doesn't ring of the kind of values that people want to then be completely identified with. And I, I really hope I get a chance to say that to some people, the, the, the kind of contradictions around money and wealth that you see some people expressing in the midst of that equality is something that becomes a big disappointment. I'm not taking as pessimistic a view as, say, my colleague John Saul might have up in Canada these, these, these days, but, but it definitely is a factor that those things that people fought for, to see them not being really fully carried forward is a disappointment. Now, my way of dealing with that is to say, you got to have a long-term perspective on all this and keep, keep the eyes on what's the long-term ahead. I just wanted to say something about the singing. Uh, the youth movement I belonged to in the 1950s with uh, Dr. Jaime Rochman. Uh, Jaime you, sings? No, no. <laughs> I haven't mentioned the singing part. Oh, okay. But we used to play music of two Americans that we really loved. They were absolutely precious. And the one was a folk singer called Pete Seeger. Mm -hmm. We and still love him. We knew a lot of his songs. And there was one, uh, and the other was Paul Robeson. And if ever there was a link between South Africa and the United States, it was Paul Robeson. Uh, and it saddens me that he's not the famous figure here that uh, he'd become in South Africa. He was a national hero to us. And it had a lot to do with his voice and his personality and his stature and his internationalism. 
And in the Modern Youth Society, as it was called, I got a little bit of credit because I could sing quite... <laughs> I dreamt I saw Joe Hill last <laughs> night. Alive as you and me, <laughs> says I, but Joe, you're ten years dead. I never died, says he. Hey, he went off a little bit there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and a lot of people are singing, and you see little white kids now in the choirs, and they're learning to move. <laughs> you know, the. the uh, they it, rhythm. They're getting, they're getting rhythm and they're enjoying it. And it's not like a lesson, you know, it, it's like, it's fun. And even at, at Loftus Fairsfield, that the citadel, you know, of, of rugby, uh, what used to be white Africana uh, hegemony and domination, they'll sing Torture Loza. Uh, and a little bit out of step and a little bit out of sync and so on. But the song of the most oppressed, of the people who would be Chaloza, boom, you know, with the pickaxe hitting the ground, has now become a, a song that's sung on big, big sporting occasions. So that element of musicality is, is still strong in, uh, in our country. Uh, dance is also very strong, beautiful contemporary dance. And anybody who creates any mischief anywhere, you do it, you dance. So you're going on strike, you're marching through the streets, you're protesting. Um, that that uh, quality still remains. Somehow industrialization, commercialization hasn't Hasn't destroyed that. Hasn't destroyed that. Yeah, yeah. I'll note that uh, post-apartheid South Africa has also um, given not only South Africa, but the world the Treatment Action Campaign, which I think has had a quite important effect globally on campaigns for antiretrovirals and retrovirals and more generally access to essential medicines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but with, I think we should open the floor now to questions for our speakers. Yes. I wanted to say, I'm, I don't want to say how old I am, but I remember in the early 80s when Ronald Reagan was president and the anti-apartheid movement was gathering a lot of steam. Nobody was sure where it was going to go. But I saw Gene Kirkpatrick, who was Ronald Reagan's representative to the United Nations give a speech one day. And they were saying, well, why doesn't the United States send the military to South Africa to help put down the revolt? The blacks are violent, they're communists, they're all these horrible things that we usually fight every place. And she candidly said, our military is 30% African American. It's 20, 25% Latino. They are not going to do it. <laughs> She said, we are going to, she said, the anti-apartheid, she basically said, eventually, America's not going to be able to help South Africa. Mm -hmm. This was like 82 or 83. She said, our troops are not going to do it. Mm -hmm. That was probably a factor. It's not going to happen. It was probably a factor in the fact that, sure. in fact, when South African troops went in to fight in what ultimately became uh, the fight in Angola, that, in fact, South Africa thought that they had the assurance from Gerald Ford that that they were going to get U.S. troops coming along with them, but they didn't, and that was of course part of where ultimately then South Africa gets militarily defeated, pretty much at Quito Cuanavale, a very important moment in the struggle. We want to open up, don't we? Yes. Um, thank you both. Um, Justice Sachs, um, land reform, land redistribution, is that Florida. on the agenda? Land reform. Land reform, land redistribution. I don't know what my agenda is, <laughs> as, as I'll be, because um, I'm now a judge whose time on the court has come to an end. I'm not back in politics. So I'm not campaigning in that sense, except in a broad sense for human rights, transformation, change, education. Uh, land reform is very much on the agenda in South Africa. Um, it, it, the Constitution acknowledges the need for land reform. There's been extensive restitution of land that was seized after 1912 
uh, and and it's they've had something like eighty thousand uh, different groups and communities have got land back, so it runs into millions of people have benefited, but these are just small spots. Uh, the great bulk of the land in South Africa is still racially occupied and owned, uh, and it's proceeding pretty slowly, pretty slowly. Uh, the main pressure for land, in fact, is for housing rather than for agriculture. That's, that's where you feel it the most, that people want decent hab habitation. Housing in the urban areas and the periphery is expensive. The land is very expensive, and that's making it difficult uh, for people to be properly accommodated. But it, it, it's uh, an issue that's constantly there. It's not hot in the same way that it was and continues to be in Zimbabwe. Uh, we're a much more industrialized country and, and people want access to the economy at a level that goes well beyond uh, access to land. And then there are big problems. Do you, when you've got the land that's available for distribution, do you give it to the poorest of the poor? Or do you give it to the new middle class, black middle class, family farmers who've got capital, who can get tractors, buy seed, uh, scientific knowledge? And these are not easy questions. Emotionally, I feel it should go to the poor who've got nothing. Let them grow subsistence. But if you want to get a sustainable agriculture, I don't know. You know, these things are, are being debated and argued about. Uh, others will, will make the decisions. More questions? Yes. So this is a question which both of you that will be to Mr. I'm just wondering, you mentioned the Sudan, the poor genocide, and this university has tried their best and failed. Um, and I was wondering, you said how South Africa, uh, South, yes, how um, African Americans in the United States picked up struggle for South Africa. It's this bigger thing. It became an issue in itself. It's you know, sort of like uniting people just and it seems like, in some ways, the genocide in the poor is, is just as black as white um, in terms of you know, genocide. It's not your out. And um, why do you think people have not picked that up? And like, why do you think there are no fights? And you know, we tried to have a campaign. There were no fights. People were just like, yeah, whatever. That's happening. Um, but it was not nearly as, as you know, possible. I, I've been puzzled. I've been puzzling this question too. I'm at Columbia College. I was the faculty advisor for a, a committee that ultimately just died, trying to do work on on Sudan on Darfur. I think there are a combination of reasons. I think that one of the reasons is that f functionally, we remain pretty much illiterate about Africa in general in the United States. That is that, and that the representation of Africa is a lot like the representation, kind of the tragedy of Haiti now that we see. It's always, it's just this chaos that's presented. And there is no, 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 no balancing that picture out with showing the, all of the efforts of Haitians that are going on. So in the case of covering Africa, all you get is what Charlene Hunter Galt says is disease, death, and destruction. And I think that people have tuned off and that really there is not a real uh, literacy about Africa questions uh, that we need to have in the new period that we're in. The issues are much more complicated today. I also want to say, though, that I think that the organizing has not been patient organizing. That is to say that the, I think one of the things that went into the anti-apartheid struggle was also many years of just, you go and you speak to audiences that are only three, four people. And you did, we did that for 10, 15 years. I owed us back there, we, we could tell you that those years in the 70s, nobody came to events. Nobody didn't come to events. They didn't come. They didn't know anything. But you, you can't get quick fixes on these things. And so the organizing has to be predicated on a very long-term strategy and long educational campaigns. I think it's also difficult because the identification of who the enemy is 
is much more difficult with the question of the Sudan. And finding identifiable targets here, which also is part of good organizing, is also much more difficult in the present circumstance. But this, this may change. This may change. Uh, but I think that it's got to be done with people that are much more, uh, with organizations that do much more work around educating people about Africa. We are in a tremendous vacuum of educating the American public about Africa. The, I, 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 I won't tell you the horror stories I get in my classes about people who don't ha have any idea that there are 52 countries in Africa. I, I, we do a map test at the beginning of the course. It's not unusual at all. When I give them a blank map, it comes back, they got Cambodia in the middle of the African continent. <laughs> not at all unusual. And you yet long to go into the details of understanding what are much more nuanced questions politically now. It takes a lot of work. And the last thing is that we don't have a lot of organizations doing that work that there were in that earlier period. There is no national organization working on Africa issues that has an office here in Chicago today. It, and I just want two issues. The one is, shouldn't be the English language. Our question was in English. Our responses were in English. Yeah. People could identify. Uh, we had such problems in France. We could get support in the Netherlands and Sweden and the United Kingdom. We could hardly get an anti apartheid movement going in France. They looked at the French-speaking countries in Africa. It, so Sudan now, it, it's, it's Arabic that's spoken, and it seems a kind of remote thing, and you don't see the people and hear the people that you can identify with very, very easily. But I think there's, there's a, a deeper reason, and, and, and it's, I think it's, it's, a, it's a not unfair reason. Oppression is oppression everywhere. You've got to take a stand. But racism in South Africa tracked racism in this country. It had similar origins, and people could identify in their body, in their soul, in their spirit of what it's like to be denied your humanity and your rights simply because of your origins and your appearance. And certainly we identified with the struggles here. We read about the sit-ins, we read about Rosa Parks, we read about the bus boycotts, we read about the Little Rock. Um, we, uh, Maybe we even knew more than many Americans, black and white, knew, because this was really like our struggle. And, and the uh, Brown and Board of Education case, oh, wow. At the very time when our South African parliament was actually adopting a law saying you can have separate but unequal to get over some court decisions, and because we didn't have a constitution that that was going, the Brown and Board of Education was going the other way, saying separation in itself presupposes that there's something odd about those people, they can't mix with us, it's always them with us. Um, so so we, we took these things very much to heart. Uh, we took pride in Joe Louis, Lewis, the, the boxer, uh, Jesse Owens, you know, uh, I don't know, these things are deep and they're experiential and, and they're very real. They don't apply in relation to Darfur and sadly there are other examples of, of tragedies in the world uh, where people don't respond and one wishes one's capacity for uh, empathy got completely beyond your own particular experience but I don't think one should downgrade the significance of your particular experience. The final thing I want to also comment on, and I just would look and throw this out, I really think that this question of there being double standards about death, who dies is viewed very who who is who the dead people are is viewed differently uh, hopefully the generation that's coming along it's not the same thing but I, I I think that that racism creeps in to how these tragedies whether it's Darfur or whether it's Katrina or whether it's the current thing in Haiti how they're treated how they're covered how they're responded to 
there, you cannot escape racism and racialized attitudes on these questions. Can I play your question? Yeah, just, a, just a comment on the last three things that you were saying, and especially with regard to uh, a conflict like Darfur and why it yeah, is it is so difficult to think to organize. Uh, I agree with you, Ali, and especially that, that in this country, we only speak another language if it's the requirement of college, nine-tenths of us. Or if our parents are immigrants, we we'll to another language spoken and we learn it in the family. So if we're trying to find out about things, if we're trying to lower our ignorance, we need to look at sources that are not what's easiest for us to find on ABC, NBC, and CBS. And I've asked everybody in this room, in all the news that you've seen about Haiti in the last week, how many Haitians have you heard speaking in terms of reporting what they've been doing, what other people have been doing, whether they live in Haiti or whether they live in Florida or other places like that, helping themselves. None. Not one. You have to go to the internet, you have to listen to somebody like Kildur or Danny Schechter. Um, that's part of this covert, overt, we, uh, I agree with you, Brexit, I call it racism in terms of, but it's how we think. Uh, the first ship that went to Haiti would help. Um, after the earthquake, it was from Iceland. It was a hospital ship. What is it, 4,000 miles? They got there long before the Americans did. We sent troops because that's what we know how to do. And the troops are not doctors. There's nothing wrong with them helping. But one reason we never went there quickly is our Secretary of Defense says there wasn't security enough. So, in other words, before we send troops, they have to be secure. You know, that's black water, not fresh water as somebody else said in, in the article. We need to really understand that if we're going to do organizing, we need to find out what people themselves are doing. And that, that African voice, that Caribbean voice, that voice of those who are either oppressed or in difficulty, the fact that they help themselves begins to make us understand we're not alone. We try to help them too. Uh, I mean, I just, I'm just throwing that out there because you see it over and over and over again, the same way you're, you know. So I want to throw that out as a, as a uh, back when Craigsy and I and others were <clears throat> doing this kind of thing. You never end, ended a meeting like this without getting people to sign a card, sign up. <laughs> so I'm asking you guys if you're interested in, you know, in helping in any of these conflicts. Uh, this gentleman here, we, we put a jacket on, had some of you about um, working with, with New Orleans. Um, find out what you can do, what people themselves are doing, and follow the kind of lead that those of us in the American anti-apartheid movement did. We asked what people there wanted, and we gave them what we could that they wanted rather than what somebody else told them they needed. So I mean, I, I just sort of throw that out there. This is a companion question to the one about Darfur, and I think you've already supplied some answers, but there's another boycott movement going on, and that's the call for by Palestinian civil society for boycott, divest, and sanctions. It's had some traction elsewhere, but very little traction here in the United States. Given your experiences, what advice or, or wisdom do you have for people who want to see that movement develop in the United States? I think two things that I would say very quickly. Number one, a clear definition of the enemy. It's unequivocal so that people here cannot retreat for a minute and say that it's anti-Semitic. We, 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 we had, that's un, unequivocal for me. There has to be this clear definition that you're going after the state and the policies of the state. The second thing that I think that has to happen <coughs> is much more exposure and visitation to the region, to the area, that I just was reading last week of a trip that was made by a small group. I think that we have to increase the numbers of people who really know that struggle from a first-hand perspective, broad levels of society. And that was one of the things that happened. We didn't go to South Africa, but one of the big differences was that there were so many South Africans here with us. So that my, part of my perhaps words to the Palestinians is that we, you got to be spread out all over like the South Africans were. They were, I saw one of the South African friends, there must have been 
200, 300 South Africans living here in Chicago who were always engaged in a very wide bunches of struggles here too. So those three things, visiting, spending, more delegations going there, clarity about who the enemy is. I think that was a very important touchstone. And then also this, this other question about uh, uh, being linked in to other struggles more. Uh, that's, that's important too. Okay, not for the first time on this visit to Chicago. Uh, I, I'm making the point that uh, I want to be available just maybe one day, just, just, just maybe, as a go-between, as a mediator, as somebody. So I don't take public positions now that uh, make either side feel that... Um, that I've, I've got uh, a made-up mind, uh, so I'll, I'll leave, leave it to Prexy to, to come up with the answer. I think that the other thing is that there's a lot to be said in the Irish, the, the example that Albie raised earlier of the way in which the Irish struggle and the South African struggle interfaced with each other so much. I think that there's much more to also be said about the way in which historically the South African struggle and the Palestinian struggle have interfaced with each other very, very much. I think, for example, that bringing somebody like Ronnie Casserles on a major speaking tour here in this country would be a very smart move to make. For those of you all who may not know, Ronnie Casserles is a major leader of the South African freedom struggle, uh, is a Jewish South African, a member of the ANC, member of the South African Communist Party, one of the heroes of the struggle, who has been also a leading force raising the question of justice for the Palestinian people. He initiated the Not In My Name campaign in South Africa. It's not been easy. He's had a real difficult uphill struggle raising the question of Palestine. And it's not a settled question in South Africa itself, as many of you may know. But there, there is, there's a lot of internationalism in South Africa that's very, very impressive. It's one of the things that when you get there and visit, you'll see. I find South Africans to be extremely engaged with the world. And I think that's one of the things that we also could, could benefit from, is to have more of the South Africans here visiting, talking about the question of the links historically between South Africa and Israel, about how it came to be that the ANC had a, an alliance with the Palestinians, with the PLO, of how it came to be that Mandela came in one of his first places he went to visit was to go and visit and meet with Yasser Arafat. That was all the result of specific historical relationships. And I think those, that history needs to be also more fully presented here in this country. I'd like to, uh, kind of as a question, but offer another angle to this question about doctrine and that is, is there clarity on the side of the oppressed in terms of what their struggle is asking for and is it something that engages the people who are trying to develop solidarity? And am I wrong in thinking that perhaps the anti-apartheid struggle is very unique in that way? With the ANC having a very clear strategy, very clear leadership, and that in other struggles, it's not clear who you Beyond the fact that people are being oppressed, the, there's, that what really engages people is not so much oppression as the fact that there's a movement that's very clear and, and, and strategic among the oppressed that then you, you, you hook up to. I, just, I don't know. Maybe I'm idealizing one or the other, but it's just... 
I, I, I welcome what Albie says, but I, I think it wasn't just, and I, I would say to you that from my own personal experience in life, that one of the things that most attracted me, I'm trying to write about this some now, to Southern Africa, was always the fact that people there in the region had a very clear definition. They were clear about who they were fighting. They were clear that they weren't fighting people and individuals. And it wasn't just South Africa. The Mozambicans that I was very involved, very influenced by, the Angolans, I heard the same thing there. And I heard it from the Vietnamese, when the Vietnamese, during the Vietnam War, all of that really impressed me. At, at this age, that, as Albie said, I arrived with all this vim and vigor in London and, and started hanging around the anti-apartheid movement. I, I, I was very influenced by this country at that time. And I coming right out of the black power environment. And, you know, I, I wasn't much for white people in those days. I, you know, it wasn't uh, in a minute. I, I would, man. You know, take it on, honky. You know, we're going to get this on. But when I got around the ANC people, and particularly after I saw the viciousness of the apartheid system, and yet I marveled at here were people who could say, we aren't fighting individual white people. We're fighting a system that makes them act a certain way. And I heard it too from my friends in the Mozambican leadership that. That impressed me no end, and particularly impressed me coming from this country where I think there is so much confusion about this question. And there is so, so little, let me put it differently, there is so little interaction that takes place here in so many respects. I go still, I think it's one of the biggest challenges of the left and progressive people in this country to this day is how do we get past race and racism? I, I, it used to really annoy me to go to progressive events and be the only African-American or one of two or three or go to African-American events, especially those run by church people, and see an all-black audience. It didn't make sense to me. How, can you, how could you be a Christian, I'd say, if you can only deal with black people and not have nothing to do with white people. How you, then you're a Christian. How can you do that? How can you be a person of faith? And then I'd say to the left, how can you be a progressive if you're going to have events where you don't even have people from different parts of the community? And of course, maybe this is because I come from Chicago, <laughs> which I'm convinced, you know, this is one of the, this, this city remains a place that Vorster and Verward and the rest would have said this is the ideal working out. He would, they would have loved catching the subway in Chicago, you know? And how you crack that open, I think, is still one of the biggest challenges that we have. One or two more questions, and then let each of you say something to bring us to a conclusion. Yes? Um, it seems like this whole question, I mean, having to do with the anti-apartheid movement in the U.S., a lot of the rationale had to do with sort of the, the Cold War environment and the whole question of, you know, communist influence and that kind of thing in Africa and in the world. So the question I had sort of had to do with, you know, how much did the end of apartheid have to do with sort of the end of the Cold War, in your opinion, and also about the uh, extent of communist influence in the movement in South Africa. What was that like? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, that, that, that was the biggest weapon used by the white races in South Africa. That we are a bastion on the African continent against communism. The issue wasn't communism. The issue was racial oppression in the constitution, in the law, in the conduct, the behavior. Uh, if you look at the definition of the Suppression of Communism Act, apart from banning the Communist Party, anybody who want, wanted to bring about social economic change by unlawful means was deemed to be a communist. So you've got 80% of the people don't have the vote, 
They want to bring about change. You do it by sit-ins, protests, and so on. You're a communist. You're deemed to be a communist. And that played out pretty well here in, in the United States. But what's interesting was that it wasn't playing anymore, even when the Cold War was still pretty strong uh, in the middle 80s. So you can't say it was the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, that brought about the change. There was this huge, this huge movement in the United States. It wasn't related to that at all. And um, the fall of the Berlin Wall certainly facilitated looking at apartheid for what it was, blatant racial oppression, and, and keeping the Cold War aspect out of it uh, but it wasn't the reason for the transformation and, and, and for the change. Um, I just read Disgrace by Kutsoya, and I was wondering if either of you have read it and what you think. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's the other question? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll answer that. So I guess I can't help but kind of bring Jimmy back into this because it was already kind of presented, but uh, a lot of these topics, or a lot of these points that you made are very salient in this uh, struggle. There's been so many, I guess, political uh, problems, and there's so many so many things that have, uh, I guess, wreaked havoc on this small nation, um, mainly done by our government. So as far as actually what you're talking about, like identifying the enemy, if the enemy is our state, how does that play into that as far as galvanizing popular opinion in this country against our own policies. Um, and another thing, maybe uh, for you, Albie, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, following our ouster or removal, forceful removal by our country in 2004, the fact that he's been staying in South Africa for the last, you know, number of years and been gracious graciously accepted there, got his PhD in, you know, modern languages and and asked me to go back. I mean, these are things that I think we can, uh, it's, it's symbolic in a way, but there's, I think there's potential for long-term major change around an issue like that. So who's that? Uh, Aristide. Oh, uh, yeah. Let me, let me, let me take the, the part that, you know, I'm a historian by training, but I'm an activist. I'm a Staunton Lynn kind of historian. I'm a Du Bois kind of historian. You don't learn the history just to keep it on your shelf in the room. It's to apply it to help improve the world, improve society. And the overall picture you get is a very clear one about our role historically. We have been a predator nation. We're not a nice people. Our state has done some rotten, horrible stuff all over the world. Not good stuff. For, for me, it's also related to what we then have decided to adopt as a method of organizing the society in the name of the development of free enterprise and capitalism. I was listening to the debate today, this morning, over health care. How do you end up getting to a situation like where we're at right now in this country with 40 million people with no health care whatsoever, nothing, and now the debate is grounding down to the question of people who are throwing up a thing saying, you can't force us to have to buy health care. It's, it's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous, that the, and, and it's grounded in such a vicious selfishness that seems to be the ethic that's behind this, just selfishness, greed, and self-promotion. It's, and it's consistent with the whole history. Our history in Haiti is a history of rape and pillage and, and just taking advantage of those people. It's a scandal that we're sending soldiers instead of the hospital care and the, ho the physicians and the doctors and the nurses that should have been there to start out with. 
And yet that's the pattern that we can repeat all over the world. I watched a little show on American Samoa. Maybe some of you all saw that last night on 60 Minutes. The thrust of the 60 Minutes show was American Samoa has brought out all these NFL football players. That was the thrust of the show. As a side light, they brought out that it is a total colony of the United States. There was no emphasis on that part. But now, I hope that a lot of brothers and sisters on the south and west side of Chicago saw this show and saw all those people suffering, saw the fact that the sugar company is about to leave. I think it was a sugar company. What was it, sugar? Tuna. Tuna company is about to leave, and they're going to be left with nothing but the possibility for a very few of playing in the damn NFL and getting concussions for the rest of their life. So the system stinks. And I think that that's a history we've got to face up to, that I hope some generation, when people really understand it more, will accept that and embrace it and say, we apologize to the world for the stuff we've done all over the world. And it isn't to say this makes American people bad. This ain't about American people. It's about the system that greed and, and avarice have created that we have foisted all over the world. The apologies that we all owe all over Africa are just monumental. All parts of Africa, and, and, and including the role that we played in South Africa throughout. The one big thing I've had as an objection to the, 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 the whole Truth and Reconciliation Commission of in South Africa process is that it didn't go to the U.S. bankers and corporations that got so much money out of that whole deal and are now just sitting back and watching that inequality that's still there. Because they watch the inequality in this country too. We got to know our history. Got to know it. Bobby, would you like to yes. reflect on that TRC comment? No, I'm going to um, respond to the disgrace and maybe just say a few wrapping up words. Um, we, we, we pronounce the name Kutsi. Kutsi, yeah. He's a brilliant writer, he's an amazing writer. Uh, very, uh, he lives in his head. You can sit down with him for an hour. It's notorious at dinner. He doesn't say a word. But he writes, uh, he's got an amazing pen, and he's been doing it for decades now, and he got the Nobel Prize for Literature a couple of years back. And that's following on Nadine Gordon, whom I do know very well, who's my friend, and who's also brilliant. And I think it's not an accident South Africa's produced two uh, absolutely outstanding writers in the past couple of decades, uh, because... The whole uh, tension and struggle relating to apartheid created um, a sharpness and intensity uh, that reflected itself in, in language uh, and modes of presentation. Uh, Disgrace is, is uh, an amazing book in many ways. It's, it's intensely readable. Uh, it didn't reach me. I, I didn't feel an empathy and a connection with the central themes. It doesn't mean that I, I, I think any the less of Kutsi as a writer, but to me the huge difference is uh, it, it's basically about a, a white intellectual, a university person, teaches English, he's fed up with the way English is being taught now, it's, it's, it's all compartmentalized and the deep passion and, and themes and so on of literature uh, are being diminished, he has an affair uh, and in that it ends up with, um, is, is it his daughter? His daughter gets raped uh, in a rural area uh, by, uh, I don't know if it's one person or gang raped Africans. Gang raped. Hmm? Gets gang raped, I think. Yeah. Uh, and, and, but she doesn't respond with pure rage. She acknowledges why there's so much anger around and she tries to come to terms and, and to live with it. Uh, well, Kutsi is now living in South Australia, 
And it's partly that his experience of Africa is just so different from mine. That's why I read the book in, in a different way. He comes from the Western Cape. The African community, by African I mean black African, uh, speaking indigenous African languages, deeply imbued with African culture. Uh, the Western Cape, we have a, a population, that's why Fisk was so much like Cape Town. Like Cape Town. Uh, slave descendants whose languages of origin were destroyed. Uh, and to speak Afrikaans and, and, and English. And that's the milieu in which he grew up. So he sees this rather frightening vision of Africa. Uh, and uh, he, he's struggling to find a way of, of, of dealing with it. For me, uh, Africa is, is, um, is Oliver Tambo uh, representing, and I can go through many, many others, such a warm embrace. I was a 17-year-old a law student, I would be put up on platforms uh, to speak every Saturday afternoon. Uh, we would have these protest meetings, sometimes 50 people, sometimes 500, sometimes 5,000, sometimes even more. And I felt, you know, what right have I got to speak? I'm not oppressed. I'm not, I'm not suffering. Um, they said, no, Comrade Albie, you must be there. We speak about non-racialism. But it's no good we just speak about it as a principle. Unless the people see someone like you, it will be very abstract and, and, and meaningless. And, and so uh, I, I, I would speak. I would be embraced with affection. They weren't sucking up to me. They didn't need me for anything. They were just so happy to see that this vision of non-racialism was being achieved. Uh, it, it was the total reverse of the rape of the assault. Mm -hmm. uh, I always felt with Oliver Tambo that he had this vision, the whites are never generous enough, warm enough, open-hearted enough to embrace the whole nation. They are inward-looking, fearful, greedy. Uh, he would use words like that, but so wrapped up in their narrow world they can't have a vision of a whole country. We African people who've known so much suffering, we can show that it's possible for black and white to live together. And we must set the example with generosity. When I came in 1992 to Chicago, and it was not long after Harold Washington had died, and the phrase I heard and I felt, wow, this is us. No one, whoever you are, would escape my fairness. Yeah, that's what he used to say. Yeah. He could have been speaking to us in South Africa. That was that vision. So that's why for me the whole central concept, the subtratum, the, 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 the message, if you like, of, of disgrace is just wrong, 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 wrong. Uh, and, and slightly bizarre and, and, and rather odd. But it doesn't take away my respect for him as a writer, and he carries on writing, and he presents his different views, and it's all part and parcel of that wonderful mix uh, that, that, that is, is the new South Africa. I think that's not a bad note to end on. I want to end with one other note as well, and it's my way of thanking Albie. I've had the great fortune of entertaining here on the south side of Chicago, within this very parameter, two wonderful South Africans. One was Ruth First, and when Ruth First, who you all must look up and read about, she very much embodied everything that Albie was just talking about, about Africans, but it was about Ruth, although she was a demanding intellect. Ruth came here and she spoke to a whole bunch of us, and that night, that Saturday night, she wanted to do one thing more than anything else, and that was to go here and visit a club, that, and the name is escaping me, that was here on the south side, Checkerboard, the old checkerboard. And Ruth wanted to go and hear the blues at the checkerboard. And so we went that night. And the place was just jammed out. This is roughly 1984, something like No, it couldn't have been because Ruth died in 82. So it must have been in 1970. Do you remember Otis when it was? Huh? And what year was that? I can't remember the year. We went to the damn party, and Ruth started dancing. 
And she just danced and danced and danced. And there were some sisters there at the checkerboard who were dancing with Ruth. Ruth was a little frail thing. Now, I was, and Otis and others, we were responsible for Ruth. And this one sister kept wanting to dance with Ruth. She was a huge sister. And every time she grabbed Ruth, I'd say, oh, shit, she's going to crush this woman. But Ruth just loved that whole night, and people loved Ruth. Well, in 1991, was that the first ANC conference back in the country? Uh, yeah. Albie may not know that I was sitting there watching this, but I was in the back of a huge gym. And they introduced Albie. And they said, Albie, come up to the front. And Albie walked, and as he went to the front, people toy toyed and danced. There was maybe, oh, I don't know, 10,000 people in that gym, and they all danced and toy toyed. And Albie got up there to the front of the stage, and he said, he threw up this arm, a mama! And people went nuts. And I said to myself, this is what makes it worthwhile. Here are all these black folk, they don't see Albie as a white man. This is a man who has contributed profoundly to their struggle. It was an incredible lesson for me.